first seminar today. What I'd really like to see is Philip Duff doing another seminar. Then obviously, today is your lucky day. Right? Uh, of course, I cannot do exactly my friend David Kaplan's seminar. I would like to do my kind of an opening a bar, signing a deal seminar. And it's a lot of stuff that's put together from seminars I have taught before about how to open a bar or negotiate a deal. So it is quite close, I think like 70%. And I will also zoom out a little and talk about things that are important to everybody opening a bar anywhere. Because I cannot tell you specific financial advice for dealing with the governments in Canada or how things are here, because I don't know. <laughs> and I'm leaving tomorrow. I won't be here long enough to learn. But there are things about negotiating and structuring a deal that are the same everywhere. And for the last 20 or 30 minutes, we're going to have a little discussion with myself and Nico De Soto and Sam Dalcor about opening a bar, what we wish we had learned before, uh, the experience that we had to pay to learn, and what has changed between opening a bar six, seven, eight years ago, or even in the last year or two. So, with that said, there's a cocktail coming out. Uh, JP, do you want to come and explain what this delicious beverage is? Do you want to come and explain what this delicious beverage is? You, be you better bring one uh, to show to me. No, no, you'd really better come. Can I have a daiquiri, please? Mm -hmm. So, good afternoon, everybody. So, we're basically having a Dave Kaplan's cocktail. Well, his recipe, so I didn't change it much. Uh, it's basically a daiquiri and with Calvados. So, it's a Normandy number two. Daiquiri number two, Normandy cocktail. So it's served up, we just shaked it. It's a one and a half uh, Bacardi for half an ounce of um, Calvados VS, lime juice, and simple syrup. So enjoy that, and I'll, we'll be back with uh, round two shortly. Bravo. Thanks, JP. <laughs> yeah. Got to remember to charge my phone. There you go. Long day. So, uh, another particularly good picture of me, <laughs> as well as presenting seminars, in 2008 with a partner, I opened Door 74 in Amsterdam. It's a 40-seat speakeasy cocktail bar. The door is locked, all that kind of nonsense. It's still open. It still does really great business. It does about the equivalent of a million dollars a year in sales. No food. Thank you. It's number 33 in world's 50 best bars. We're much happier with the fact that it actually makes a profit. Before I opened the bar, and to this day, most of my business is actually my consulting company, Liquid Solutions, which creates education programs for uh, drinks brands and bars all around the world. And before I opened this bar, obviously, I thought I knew everything about opening bars, and I realized it's like being married or pregnant or something, owning your own bar is something you can only learn by doing it. Nothing else can prepare you for it. Uh, Fabienne and Sam did that with Le Lab in Montreal, and Nico has done that with Mace in New York, and he's actually in the process of opening his own second bar in Paris, which he'll be telling us about a little bit later on. So first of all, let's deal with the basics. Why would you open a bar? Normal, sane, intelligent people with real, proper, grown-up jobs think that a bar is like a money machine, <laughs> right? You've no idea. I've met, I, there's one guy I know, he was, act, he really was, I checked this, because people say all kinds of bullshit in bars. I, he's, he was the number one in his Harvard MBA class. He is one of the smartest people I know. And I was sitting with him in a big busy bar in New York, 
And he was like, well, this place must be fucking killing it, man. Look at all those people. The cocktails are $18 each, all this. And he, he just did not believe me when I told him that the typical net profit margin for a bar is 8 or 9%. He literally could not believe it. And he's one of the smartest people I will probably ever meet. So lots of people open a bar because they want that boss feeling, right? How many times has somebody said to you, it's like, yeah, you know, after I retire, I think I'll just, I'll just like buy a little bar. <laughs> like nobody ever says, you know, after I've retired, I'll just, I'll just buy a little salt mine. You know, yeah, I'm just going to do a little toilet cleaning on the side, just for the fun, all right? Why? Why would you open a bar? Sean Sewell, uh, my, my Australian friend, who has founded a fantastic mixology scene in Victoria, BC, his mother owned and ran cafes her whole life, cafes, restaurants, and she told him something which I think is some of the smartest advice. The hardest number of bars to own is one. It really is absolutely true. If you only own one bar, you will never be able to relax. You will always need attention because you don't develop a general manager, a manager. You don't delegate. You do everything yourself. When you have two or three or four or five, you are forced to be a teacher and a delegator and a manager. So why would you open a bar? Well, there are obvious reasons. And that, if you open a bar... That's about as close as you will get to real money for a long time. Uh, which is not to say that there is no money to be made in bars. There is, but it's hard work. In almost every other industry, it is easier to make money. But there is money to be made in bars. Uh, bars are brilliant, absolutely brilliant platforms. If you have a bar... You can get a book deal, you can get a TV deal, you can get a consulting deal with a liquor company. You can be asked to speak at things like Invasion Cocktail and Tales of the Cocktail. You can be asked to be a partner in a liquor brand, as happened to Jim Meehan, for instance, with Banks Rum. You can use the bar to start your own brand. Yeah, which my friend Dushan Zarek did with the 86 Co out of Employees Only. So a bar is a very, very democratic place. That Harvard MBA guy would never have talked to me if he hadn't been introduced by one of the bartenders. And one of the bartenders said, oh, you want to talk about the bar business? You should talk to Philip Duff. He's the director of education and all that. And because we were in this democratic space, the bar, that guy spoke to us. So in a bar, if you own a bar, because everyone has this reverence for the bar owner, you can make all kinds of deals. A bar is a really, really good platform to have. You can, when you're making a deal, you can invite people round to the bar and everyone will kiss your ass there because they know it's an important deal, <laughs> right? You know, just say to your staff, do not fuck this up for me, right? I've got a deal going on here. It's a really, really powerful thing. People who make $100 million a year will call you on your phone begging for reservations or space at the bar or for somebody else to be looked after. It's a great thing. You will need many tools to be a successful bar owner. You will need to be able to deal with chaos. I don't know if you can read this. That it, yeah, it says chaos German style. Uh, I first used this slide in Germany. They like that. Um, but you need to be the kind of person who can deal with chaos and risk. And if you're not sure if you are that person, it's time to start finding out now. Forget everything, all the bullshit they tell you about on TV shows like Dragon's Den. It is a, cons a constantly evolving thing, the world of bars. There is risk, there is financial risk, personal risk. You don't know what laws are gonna be passed. In Canada, for instance, state monopolies on alcohol mean you sometimes literally don't know if a product is going to be available next month or, or not. It's a chaotic, dynamic environment. Some people love that. You will need to be able to manage your time. 
Now, if you email me afterwards, I'll send you a copy of this presentation. But if you're going to write something down, this is the single most important one. The world is full of things for you that are urgent and things that are not urgent. And many things that are urgent are not important, and many things that are important are not urgent. I urge you to draw this square every morning and divide up the things you are going to do. We normally, when you don't want to do something, when it's difficult or risky or annoying, instead of doing something which is urgent and important, we do something which is urgent and unimportant. That's why if I have some really big decisions to take, you will notice that my house is immaculately clean and tidy. Right? I've done the hoovering, I've polished the wine glasses. Instead of sitting down and going through the finances for a brand that I'm starting or some other business deal. This, very important. Very, very, very important indeed. You'll need to be a manager. Now, many times bartenders tell me that they don't really want to be a manager or they don't want to manage their staff. It's like, I'm going to hire good people. We're all going to get along. I'm going to work right alongside them. All this. That's all bollocks. If you own the bar, you are a manager. And if you do not manage your staff, you are letting them down. In fact, I would go so far as to say it is selfish to bartend if you're the owner. Right? You're indulging yourself a bit too much. Instead, you should be managing your staff to be amazing bartenders and indeed training them to be managers in your absence. But you will need to be a manager. So delving into the, the management skills a bit. Book recommendation number one, this one. It's by a guy called Felix Dennis, uh, the richest self-made man in England at one stage. He invented online computer retailing. He created the magazines, including Maxim magazine. Uh, and unlike most of the how to get rich books that you read, he didn't have to write this one. He's, or was, he died two years ago, really rich, right? Like Donald Trump, for instance, not really rich. All the money he has is what his father left him. All the books he writes about how to get rich are about how to get rich, writing books, how to get rich, right? This is the only one I've ever found that was written by somebody who didn't need to write it, and it's brilliant. It deals with every aspect of being a businessman, an entrepreneur, and a manager. This is book recommendation number two, Getting More by Stuart Diamond. I will spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, Stuart Diamond is a Wharton University professor of negotiation. He used to be a journalist and he won a Pulitzer Prize. He has successfully negotiated peace in Eastern Europe. He negotiated the end of the movie writer's strike in uh, Hollywood several years ago. This is a best-selling book. It is a completely new model of negotiation. Most negotiation books, trainings, maybe you see them in, you know, the airline in-flight magazines where it's like, come to the three-day, $4,000 negotiating thing. as like a picture of like a pretty woman in a business suit with a cigar. And it's basically, let us teach you how to fuck other people over, right? That's the general model of negotiating. It's what an economist would call a zero-sum game. They will, you, if I win, you lose. This is not that, and it is also not Win-win, because win-win does not exist, of course. What it is, is understanding that in a negotiation, everybody wants more, that's number one, and more means something different for each party. I urge you, with all my heart, to buy this book and make it your homework. Read it before next week, finish it. It's very well written, it's funny, it's intelligent, it's got a whole section on it, negotiating with your children, it's great. And I will distill it down for you 
into the relevant parts for us uh, bar people. One is that more for me is different to more for you. So here is an example. Supposing somebody has a space. They own the building. They have a space. There was a bar in there before. And the bar was noisy and messy and dirty and they never paid the rent and there was complaints from the police. There were drug addicts and people come out of the bar and they'd piss against the side of the building and the neighbors would complain, all that. And you talk to the owner. That owner, of course, does not want that again, right? They want to rent, but they would probably even lower the rent if you could guarantee that nobody would be pissing against the front of the building, or not many people anyway. Right? That's what more might look like to them. More to you would be a good landlord, a nice building, a reasonable rent. Understanding the other person really is at the heart of getting more. And it doesn't mean being some emotional yoga, carrot juice hippie. It means going out and doing your research. Work out what more means to somebody else. My bar, door 74, is in a stable, a horse stable, believe it or not. It's been a horse stable for about 120 years. And in fact, it's not even the horse stable. It's the workshop next to the stable. Instead of horses in the stable now, there are cars. The space is owned by a luxury hotel in Amsterdam. And they bought up loads of these spaces to park their guests' luxury cars in. So if you roll up at the Hotel de Rup in Amsterdam in a Porsche or a Ferrari, there's a good chance they'll park it in the space where my bar is. And through the wall in this little space, about the size of the stage, is my bar. So it's not a commercial premises for the hotel. They kind of got it for free. They've always rented it out. What they want from me is they want me to pay the rent and not cause any hassle. That's it. That's what more looks like to them. They're not interested in getting the highest rent. Doesn't matter. It's not their core business. As a bar owner, more to me is I want a landlord who'll fix the toilets if they flood or let me take the cost out of the rent, that kind of thing. That's what more looks like to me. More looks different to different people. If you're asked to go into a space, it could be a, a big new development, you know, it could be a, a condo development or a whole new area of Montreal. I'm sure there's some area of Montreal that used to be shitty and now they're trying to fill it up with hipsters, right? There has to be one, at least. Are we, maybe we're in it, I don't know. Uh, a well run bar or nightclub or restaurant brings lots of people in. They're like, oh yeah, man, this is a cool area. I'll buy a condo. A well-run bar can drive up property values faster than almost anything. So for a property developer, more might mean a well-run bar that makes this area famous. So my $100 million investment turns into $200 million. So in that case, they might not just give you a low rent. They might not charge you any rent at all for as long as you can negotiate. Six months, a year, doesn't matter. You have to understand what more looks like to the other person. You can't be emotional, which is once more all the Dragon's Den, the Apprentice type TV programs. They're all bollocks in that sense. Never get angry, don't get upset. Don't get frustrated. Don't feel personally attacked. If the other person gets emotional, say, look, let's take a break. Let's come back next Tuesday or in an hour or something like that. Never get emotional. It's just business. That's all it is. It's only money. You can have all the money in the world, but if you or your loved ones are sick, none of the money matters. All right? It's just business. Don't get emotional. When people get emotional, you or the other person, there's no talking to them, right? If you, hands up if you've ever argued with your boyfriend or girlfriend. The rest of you are, the rest of you are lying. 
right? All of you, right? You know when you're arguing, that person will not listen to reason. There's no more logic, right? It's the same in business. It's just the same. No emotions, just business. Point three, research, research and standards. You need to find out this person you're negotiating with to be an investor, a landlord, a partner, whatever. Well, where did their money come from? And where did their investors' money come from? And who are they? Is this person like a refugee who came to Canada 30 years ago? Is it somebody who comes from a wealthy family? Is it someone who went to college? What music do they like? Where do they eat? Who are they? And what does their company do? For instance, if you're partnering with uh, a finance company or a bank that's giving you a loan, read up on the loan. Look at their mission statement. If it says, we want to invest in ethical local business, you could have a conversation about that and say, okay, we're being ethical, we're hiring minorities, we're doing this, we're doing that. Obviously, this fits your vision. And then they will be put in a place where they can't really say no to, the, to you and maintain their standards. If you fly with an airline, and it's called the world's friendly airline, and somebody is rude to you, you can complain and say, look, I thought you were the world's friendly airline. And that person told me to fuck off, <laughs> right? We increasingly define ourselves by our standards and our values, and this is very, very useful in business. Do your research. Find out, have they given anyone a break in the past? Have they developed properties in other parts of town? And how did they deal with the hospitality industry there? If somebody has invested money in hospitality before, well, how did that go? Did you get your money back? Why not? What did you like about that deal? What didn't you like? Be very transparent with people and say, look, I'm asking you these questions so I can learn more. You can ask me stuff. In fact, the guy who wrote the book, Getting More, Stuart Diamond, he says, the best thing you could possibly do in a negotiation is walk in and give the other people a copy of the book and say, this is the book I'm using. I advise you use the same book. Really, it's not about having a secret. The essential truth is that more means different things to different people. And we all want more, whatever that is. Framing is really, really cool. Uh, I'm trying to think of a polite example. <laughs> this might take a while. I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, I've now just thought of loads of really rude examples. Uh, perhaps you've seen the cartoon, Three Frames. It's a Dilbert cartoon by Scott Adams. And in the first frame, the boss is saying to a staff member, I'm sorry, you're fired. And in the second frame, the boss is just there saying nothing, and the employee is just like crying and waving, ah, all that. And in the third frame, the boss says, only joking. However, that 2% pay rise is looking pretty good now. <laughs> That's framing. Example, somebody is developing a condo or a whole area of town and they have spaces for bars and restaurants and you work out what more is for them and what it is for you and you do your research and you frame it. You say, okay, this building, luxury condo building, has 45 apartments in it that sell for $1.2 million each, right? You're asking whatever rent you're asking for a bar, right? So it's gonna be a $100 million project. The $10,000 a month for the bar barely even features in it. I mean, I know that you want to get rent. Why don't you give me nothing and I'll partner up with you and we'll sell Apartments upstairs. We'll have happy hour, people can come in the bar, 
They can see presentations from you. We'll cater cocktail parties in the show apartments, all that kind of thing. And the person will come back and say, no, of course not. I'm not giving you zero rent, but you've just won the negotiation. Why did you won? You set the frame at zero. Do you understand? That's reframing. I could go on and on and on and give you more juicy examples, dirty ones too, but there's more in the book. Framing is so important. That's why in lawsuits in places like America, they do literally go in and ask for $100 million because somebody spilled coffee on their lap, right? Because they know if they win, they'll get like 10 million or 12 million. But if you go in starting at 12, you wind up at one, right? Framing is very, very important. You will do a better deal if you know these four or five facts than if you read all the Harvard MBA business type books. I only read this book two years ago. I have since given six copies to friends and families. Every person I've given it to has called me up to thank me, including Dave, who couldn't be here today because I told him about the book when we met in New York a few weeks ago to plan this. So get this book. Oh, and the last point, which you can't quite read, uh, says shut up. Right? If you've ever been a salesman or gone and bought a car or sold cars, uh, after somebody says, no, no, we can't do this, da, 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 whatever, just shut up. Just shut up. It's really awkward when there's a very long... Pause. So people will say stuff. They'll start saying things like, well, I mean, we can't really do it now. And, and well, well, what if, and you're just sitting there just like, learn to shut up. <laughs> learn to master the awkward pause, which is a good time to talk about this drink, JP. <laughs> yeah, man. Ooh, yum. Great speech. Thank Great you. Speech. Thank you. I don't speak English very well, but it's cool. Um, <clears throat> so you're having right now uh, a cocktail call called the Ice Queen, which is uh, basically made from, um, once again, Bacardi Maestro. You have a little bit of um, white cream liquor, <laughs> lime juice, simple syrup, uh, some muddled cucumber. It's a double strain, and then uh, we top it off with some uh, sparkling wine. We used uh, Martini Prosecco for this one because you drank all the champagne this morning. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and well, it's pretty much it. Yay! So fun. Thanks, JP. Hey, uh. Yum. So, you need to be able to negotiate. You need to be able to research. You gotta be able to speak in public. If you don't like speaking in public, you will not be a good bar owner, you won't. You have to be able to speak to your staff, your investors. You have to be able to speak to stakeholders. You might have to present to a community board and convince them to allow you to have a legal license. You will be, well, you might be able to go around the world and talk about your bar at seminars like this and increase its fame. You can learn to be a better public speaker. Join an organization like Toastmasters, where you meet every week or every couple of weeks, and you all get up and give speeches and you critique each other. That's a real thing, and it makes you a 1,000% better speaker. Become a better, perfect public speaker. That was weird. Uh, <laughs> as you may guess, I am not a member. Yeah. Uh, you will need to be a good writer. You will. You have to be able to write clearly and concisely, which means short, in a short way. You have to be able to write persuasively. There are courses on this. Do any course at all on like business writing. It will make you better at writing business emails, communication, manuals. It will also make you a funnier writer. Most of humor is about taking things out instead of uh, adding things. 
Business writing is equally about editing. Become a better writer. All right? You will need to be in physical shape. This is perhaps the, t the oddest one to put out here. And yet, the most significant one. Everybody has probably had the experience, certainly if you're under the age of 30, or over the age of 30, of just feeling like a bag of shit. <laughs> right? Just like completely bloated, fried food, hair looks like shit, can't even remember where the gym is, hangover after hangover. After. You, you are, your body is physically weakened. If you are consistently sleeping eight hours a night, going to the gym every day, eating healthily, I'm not saying don't drink, but have at least two or three days a week when you don't drink any alcohol, if you are able to relax. And by relax, I mean not just catch up with all the shit in your private life you should be doing, but turn off from that as well and just sit there with a book, right? Or your sunglasses on, lying in the park, I don't know. But to be able to relax, you must be able to do it. You need physical, digestive, and mental fitness to be a bar owner. And that means if you want to go out and get wasted and take pills and all that kind of thing, now's the time to do it before you open a bar, <laughs> right? Get it done, right? Go, go now. It's, it's almost time, <laughs> right? Make all your mistakes, right? Chase boys or girls or whatever it is that you like. Do it all now and get it done. Tick the box. Right? Get it done. Because those things will all distract you and maybe even derail you when you become a bar owner. Right? You will also, if you're thinking about being a bar owner, you need a stable private life. Because that private life is what will help you relax. You need to have a partner or a good circle of friends who are not in the industry. Uh, or, or some, some like cats and dogs that you really love, whatever, <laughs> so that you can go home and relax and switch off. Yeah, if you're sharing a house with two other bar people, you're just going to go home and get wasted, right? And when you open a bar, it is so stressful. It is like being in the Olympics. It's unbelievable. It's the best way to lose weight, I can assure you. Uh, you need to be in shape. You need to be ready. All the wildness has to be gone out of you. Gone. Right? You cannot be midlife crisis man who decides to open a bar when he's 45 so he can chase teenage waitresses. That doesn't last very long. Right? Need to be in shape. This is true for any entrepreneur, really. It's just that the temptations are so much greater uh, in, our, in our industry. <laughs> Ironically, as I take a sip of a cocktail. <sighs> so, do you need a partner? Well, <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. Um, I had a business partner in Door 74. Technically, I still do. And we had a disagreement, which was based on me disagreeing with him stealing enormous amounts of money. Uh, and we had, it really, it was about as bad as it could ever get, what happened with me and Sergei, right? He was, he was stealing money from Door 74 to help keep his other bar afloat. Um, he wasn't paying the staff. Uh, he hid about $100,000 in extra debt from me. Um, what really did it for me was, um, after about three weeks, was this young girl, she's about 18, she just started as a waitress, she's a really nice, sweet young girl, and she came to me and said, Philip, would you mind if I could get paid, because I haven't been paid in three weeks, and I was like, okay, fuck this shit, <laughs> and we had to go to court, so I'm fight, fighting a court case, living in New York with somebody in Amsterdam, where I used to live, and eventually I won, and I won an enormous amount of money, and I'm getting that money slowly now. So great. But it was as bad as it could get. 
And people asked me immediately afterwards, oh, would you, would you have another partner again? And I'm like, I totally would. I know 100% more about having partners now. In a way, I've gotten an education about it. I'm also divorced and remarried. I wouldn't have got remarried, right, if I hadn't learned more the first time around. So have a partner or don't have a partner, it's really up to you. But there is no one way to, to recommend it or not recommend it. They, they all have uh, pluses and minuses. This is actually one of Dave's slides, because I think it's brilliant. And this is about how to do a pitch to an investor or a partner or to a landlord or something like this, which is to tell a story. One of the newest fields of education within MBA and business training is actually teaching people to tell stories. Leaders of any business are marked as being more effective if they can tell a story, if they can stand up and, I mean this quite literally, say, I have a dream, as Martin Luther King did all those years ago. Tell a story, have a beginning, a middle, an end, a third act, a crisis, a baddie, a goodie, you know? Tell a story, structure it in that way. Play to human emotions. Show enough, not everything, so if you have some what you think secret tips and tricks, don't give them all away. Talk to people and then talk with people. A dialogue, not a monologue. Because you see, you're still trying to work out what more means to them. You can do your research on paper, on the internet, all you like, but you never find out unless you talk to them. And keep talking. If you have a meeting and they say no, just say, Grant, let's have a drink next week. Pick up the thread, whatever. You never know. No doesn't always mean no. And instill FOMO, fear of missing out. Make them think, I might be missing out on the next dead rabbit or the next nomad or the next shady pines or the next Alinea. Work out what more means to them. So, research in a wider sense for your bar. You probably have a picture in your head of what your bar might be like. And the smartest thing to do is to look around at what is in your area and see what there isn't. If there are brilliant craft cocktail bars around and there's enough of them, don't open one. Open something else, something you've seen work somewhere else that you think will work where you are. I opened my bar in Holland. It was the first serious craft cocktail bar, the first speakeasy. So we were immediately famous. That's why we got into all these world's 50 best bars list. It's not, it's, not, it's a good bar, right? But there's lots of good bars that aren't in that world's 50 best bar list. However, we were the first one in Holland. That gave us a huge advantage. I wouldn't open another bar like that in Holland now. I wouldn't. I try to do something else, something uh, innovative. Look at the way that your city is developing. Are they changing bus routes, tram routes, public transport? Are they building new highways and roads? Is that area over there going to be the next Brooklyn or East London or whatever? What are people doing? Are they moving into the center or moving out? In New York, where I live, people are actually moving from Brooklyn back to Manhattan now because Brooklyn has got too expensive. And that's a trend. They're moving to places like the Upper East Side and the former Hell's Kitchen. They're going to finish the Second Avenue subway line in New York soon. So all the neighborhoods that were so far over to the east of Manhattan, as you look at it, suddenly they're going to be able to move around Manhattan four times as quick so people will buy apartments there. So they'll need bars and restaurants there. So think about that. Your research is all encompassing. Other things to think about, staff cost. Uh, minimum wage, government mandated minimum wages have gone up in Seattle, San Francisco. They're going up in New York, all around the world. So maybe you have to think about a concept that would make money without having a high staff cost. What could you do that would do that? Who knows? If you have an idea, keep it to yourself or I will totally nick it. Uh, 
but time spent on research is not wasted. Your business plan, I'll tell you my personal view. You can get professional help to develop a business plan. And the problem is, at a certain level, everybody can create a great business plan. So professional investors and banks and stuff like that, the, the, many of them have told me, by the time we see a business plan, it's a pretty awesome business plan. But the plan actually doesn't mean anything because all the plans we see are awesome. What matters to us is the people. If you're raising money from friends and family, your friends and family don't really give a shit about the business plan. What they care about is you. So I would say spend time on the business plan, but not too much time. It's not this magical thing that if you write the business plan, boom, you, you get the money and that's it. Far too much importance is attached to it, in my opinion. So, you need to write a bit of a, a road trip map. Where are you going? Are you going to have one bar and use it as a springboard for a consulting career? Do you want to have two bars? Do you want to have 10 bars? Do you want to franchise your bar into every Hilton hotel in the world? Do you want to get a TV show? What, wh where are you going with this? Have a plan, have a five-year plan. What does success look like and how do you get there? You might just think, well, I want lots of money. I want great big piles of cash so I can take off all my clothes and roll around in it like Dogbert Duck, you know, the rich uncle. That's great, but how do you get there? And what's the quickest way to get there? Should you be opening bars? Should you be managing bars for other people? Should you be a consultant? Who knows, are you gonna own the building? And what does victory look like? Is this when you can buy out your investors or when you get a salary but you don't actually have to go in and work every day? What's your definition of victory? That's a pretty interesting one. And what's your exit strategy? Because you have to think about this. You might fall out of love with this industry one day. You might. You might get burned out and hate it. You might need to get divorced and need a load of money for that. I'm told it's expensive if you do it wrong. <laughs> you might be terminally ill. Or you might just, for whatever thousand reasons, have to or want to step away from the business. And you'll need to plan for that on your own or with your partners or whatever. It doesn't mean you need to have a huge plan, but you need to work out. It's like if I'm in business with you and I suddenly want to get out, like, well, you have to buy me out or I loan you my shares or you borrow money. How does it work? How do you exit from this business? For a bar, for any business, raise money before you need it, at least a year in advance. The thing about raising money is you don't need to use it straight away. You can keep it in reserve for when you do need it. But raising money is a full-time job on its own. Sharing equity. There is a saying in entrepreneurship that loans are expensive, but equity is even more expensive. I'll give you an example. Uh, I wish I could say the name of this guy. Um, and if you buy me a few drinks later on, I will. But He owns a very, very successful bar, and they recently started paying back people who'd invested in it. I said after a few drinks. Uh, so this person, who might be male or female, owns a bar. And um, there was an investor who only put in, I think, like $20,000, right? Oh, JP, cocktail break. What are we having, mate? The same thing, I just wanted to say the name. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, 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 now I get it, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so this person put in $20,000, right? And within a very short time, got the $20,000 back and now gets something like uh, $8,000 a year, right? Share of the profits. You following me? And my friend's like, fuck, that's almost not worth it. And I'm like, dude... He got all the money back, and now he gets $8,000, which is, what, 40% return forever. That's a spectacularly good deal. That's really, really good. If you don't think that's a good deal, 
you need somebody to advise you and things like this. So how you break it up, people could invest only to get their money back. Maybe they get back 110% of what they put in or 120% of what they put in, but then they don't get anything. Or they get back 100% and they get a share of ongoing profits. That's possible too. Or a very common thing is sweat equity. Many of you will start bars in this way. You don't bring any money to the table at all, but when everyone, every investor has been paid back, you get 10 or 20 or 30% because you've been working there contributing your expertise, your own personal brand name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for a couple of years. Sweat equity uh, can be a great deal or a, a terrible deal, depending on how it works out. But deciding on how you split up the shareholding and to who is vital. You must recognize the value of your input because someone who's investing only money only has money to invest. There is always money to be found in the world. But if you have skills that other people do not have and you are willing to do more and more complex work than other people are willing to do, you have something that money almost literally can't buy. So, you'll need an operating agreement. The most important thing about an operating agreement is that the investors do not get to fuck with your business, right? If the sales aren't as high as they hoped or the profits aren't as big as projected, it doesn't mean they can come in and make you do, you know, two for one shots on Tuesdays or disco nights or whatever. You are there to operate it. You need a rock solid operating agreement. Do you buy or do you rent? It's very simple, you buy whenever you can. You will find it is easier to borrow $8 million to buy a building than to borrow $300,000 to rent a space and start a bar. And banks will lend you money, you might find more investors willing to work with you because when you own the building, and I don't want to sound patronizing when I say this, when you own a building, you own the building. You're not gonna screw yourself over for rent. It will always be there. It will go up in value. Take the extra risk, buy the building. In some places like New York, it's simply not possible. In which case, cut the landlord in. Make the landlord a partner. The landlord will be more attentive to repairs. He won't keep jacking up the rent. He will want you there as much as you want him there. And maybe in the future, you can even buy your way in and buy the building very, very slowly but buy whenever you can. Key money, don't pay it unless you have to. Key money is the amount you have to pay to get the key. It might be 50,000 or 100,000 or $300,000. You need to work out why they're charging this. Are they charging it because they always did? Did the last person skip out on the rent and they're trying to get that money back? Key money is very, very, very negotiable. If you're gonna come in and spend $200,000 renovating the space and making it better, you shouldn't be paying any key money at all. One of my biggest problems with my ex-business partner is that the actual owner, remember I told you the space is owned by a luxury hotel. The luxury hotel is owned by the richest woman in England, Charlena de Carvalho Heineken. Yeah, those Heinekens, yeah? <laughs> She's worth $8 billion. And I'm totally fine paying her the rent every month. She never visited, bitch. Um, I'm sure she's lovely. Uh, but, but, one of the many things my partner hid from me was he, you know, we were like re re arguing. I'm like, is there anything else? And he, well, well, we did pay some key money. I'm like, you, you had to pay key money? Because the bar, before we went in, it was a shithole. It was terrible. I'm like, you paid key money? Yeah. How much did you pay? That was 80,000 euros. And I'm like, man, what did they ask for in the beginning? And he went, 80,000 euros. That's the kind of guy I was a partner with, right? He paid the first offer. Did you negotiate? No. Key money, highly negotiable, highly negotiable. So what to look for in a location in a building? I'm gonna skip this because it's too complicated. I just have this picture here of a much younger, happier-looking Frankie with uh, Jack McGarry 
um, Bobby Hiddleston. You will be able to build a great team if you know what you want from them and if you can plan a career from them, for them. What I mean is, remember when I said, what's your route forward? Are you going to open one bar or two bars or three or four or ten? If you're going to open more than one, people can stay working for you for years. Bar back, bartender, bar manager, general manager, maybe operations manager of a few of them and a partner and all that kind of thing. But if you only open one bar, people will leave you. They will have to as they move on in life. Your team will be stars. And I consider it selfish for an owner to bartend or wait tables in his or her own bar. You should concentrate on making them stars. Nobody else. And in closing from the kind of lecture bit of this, fuck, um, the key skill of every business owner is to identify, recruit, orient, nurture, and manage talent. In fact, for us, I would say, in our industry, we're almost at the stage now where you can get at least great mixologists quite easily. You can get people who can make the drinks. You can increasingly get good bartenders, people who can make the drinks and be nice. What there is a crucial, very difficult lack of in our business is management skills. No one is training bar managers and general managers. It's all happening in-house. Some of them turn out to be great at managing, terrible at numbers, or the other way around. Increasingly, I think the route forward for uh, some of the most successful bars in the world is to develop a management training program because there is no real bar management training program anywhere in the world. There's, there's, there's two I can think of, and that's not enough for us. Of course you can. And? As a, as a manager? Well, as a manager, that is your job, obviously. But uh, without wanting to delve into it too deeply, obviously, the job of a manager, when you're the real general manager, is to prevent them happening in the first place, right? In a best case scenario. But managing conflict, as I said at the start, is a huge part of what we do because this is a chaotic industry we're in. It's not like managing an advertising agency or an accounting firm or a doctor's practice. It's inherently an unstable, odd uh, thing that we do. But this is actually one of the weirdest things in the industry, like a room full of people quietly learning, you know, who, who are all like bartenders in the industry, which is awesome and great. So speaking of bartenders in the industry, what I'd like to do now is get uh, Sam and Nico up here so we can all kind of share a little bit of our own experiences opening bars, making deals, dealing with investors, and all that sort of thing. So if you wouldn't mind turning off my mic, chaps. Nico, Sam, come, come join. What is this one, JP? You want to be the icebreaker, eh? If it's a rum and coke, you don't actually need to tell me, but... I'm not sure. Oh, okay. All right, so the last one is from, actually, the Dead & Co. New York, from Dave Kaplan. You can find it, uh, find it in, his, uh, in his wonderful book called Dead & Co. There's David and two other guys who wrote that. It's an amazing book. A lot of recipes, a lot of inspiration for me. So this is called Starfish and Coffee to give you a little boost maybe before the last seminar. So it's um, Bacardi, Carpano, Antica Formula, uh, cold brew concentrates, uh, vanilla syrup, and it's tonic on the bottom. So it's topped with the first ingredient I said. Solid. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, finally, we get to sit down. So guys, thanks for joining us here today. Pleasure. Uh, Sam, you're the, you're the local hero, so I kind of feel like we want to keep the best to last. Um, Nico, you're in one of the most complex situations ever. You're, 
You've got a bar in New York, you're opening a bar in Paris, so you've chosen two of the most difficult places in the world to open a bar, right? Uh, can you tell us how those two deals came about and what you kind of learned by doing the deals? So yeah, so basically I have a completely uh, different situation because I have no uh, money investment. Um, what happened with Greg, uh, he, he had that place in uh, his village uh, that I talked before uh, called Ruby 649. And, um, the problem with uh, that bar, it was that bar was like you know, had problem, a uh, financial problem, and it had was in debt. So the the owner of uh, Louis Six Four Nine called Zach uh, called Greg, and and they made a deal themselves. Uh, Greg put uh, money in it, and uh, and opened a new bar in it, and that's what Greg called me and to to come and do a concept and do open the bar. But the thing is, like me, I didn't put any money in it, so I didn't I, don't, I didn't have like the business plan stuff. I didn't have the research to do it. I uh, just came, basically, the place was there already. We didn't have to look for a spot. Uh, we, just, we just had to renovate it and, uh, and put the concept in it. So there's a whole section of uh, opening a bar that I'm not aware of because I'm, like you said before, um, uh, sweat equity. So we just arrived, basically. I just arrived, basically, put the concept and stuff like that. And, um, and that's true that in that kind of... That kind of uh, deal can be very tempting uh, for a bartender because you have someone who has put already the whole money and you just arrive, put a drink and stuff like that. But, but what's the good stuff to do is to choose your right partner. I knew Greg before, I'm a friend with him, so I knew like it wouldn't be a problem to open with it. But sometimes you have like, um, it all happened to all of us when you have like someone with a lot of money that come to your bar and say, oh, let's open a bar together. I have put the whole the lot of money, I have that space. And then you, you open the place and you start having problems with your business partner. And um, basically what happened, like I had, I had a guy like, um, like during the first month of May, I so say, oh, May is a good bar, but you should open in a greater place in Tribeca. And um, he was like, I put the whole money, you just arrived. But that guy comes all the time, uh, do cocaine in the toilet, uh, he's always drunk. Uh, try to hit on every girl, and you know, like even if you have like advantage to open a bar with a guy with a lot of money, you're gonna have a problem on day one opening a bar with that guy. So with Greg, with Greg at least, I was very comfortable to open a bar. Now Paris, Paris, it's uh, the, the same kind of deal. Like my business partner, they have um, that they're the one that put the money. I put the concept, I put the drinks, I put uh, the staff and stuff like that, but I didn't play with that part with looking for a spot. They had already the spot uh, there for me, so it was, it was very easy for me. So what, what, everything you said before, there's a big part of that that I'm not aware of. So to return to it, like that guy who wanted to open a bar in Tribeca, for him more was like owning his own bar where he could do cocaine in the toilets and chase women. Yeah, no, 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 no <laughs> exactly, that's what you wanted. You know, that kind of, those kind of guys, they have a lot of money, and for them, they see like, uh, they see a bar that's, you know, oh, I like the drink at Maze, I have money, I'm gonna open my bar. For him, he doesn't think about like a repetition, he doesn't care about all that because he have money. Uh, you don't want that kind of partner for sure, yeah. There's, um, there's a guy I, I met who is, his day job is global head of private equity at Credit Suisse. He makes every year 50 to 100 million dollars. He's a lovely guy. And he put together the deal so that Will Guadara and Daniel Hum, who were both young guys, they were 28, could buy 11 Madison Park from Danny Meyer. And later on with the Nomad. And I got to know him a little bit. He works at this very high level of finance and all his colleagues were investors in bars and restaurants. Because it was almost like their social life, you know? And they did not do any nasty things. They just liked being able to get a reservation, being treated nicely when they went in. Uh, so for them, that's what more was. The money didn't actually matter. So. I think it's time for you, Mr. Zahn. For me? Um, well, so I was a bar owner for only two years of my life, uh, to be honest. It was, uh, we opened the lab about eight years ago now. And uh, to Fab and I, and it's too bad he can't join us, to Fab and I, it, was, it came kind of an, as an accident. Um, I think if you're a career bartender, or if you're a working bartender, your end game is to have, is to own your own bar. Uh, as Phil said earlier, it's not something that's easy. Uh, if you think you're gonna die covered in the riches and surrounded by virgins, it's not what's gonna happen. You're gonna have to work hard, maybe behind your bar for starters. I know there's a, a bunch of guys that do that. Um, maybe it's a financial thing. It's, uh, it's very common that bar that owner is gonna work behind their own bar as well. Uh, for us, actually, it started when we, uh, we just finished a contract in Japan. Uh, that was 2008, I believe, end of September, October. And Fab and I just had a, did a uh, consulting uh, contract back in, uh, in Kyoto. 
And so we, we came back to that, and we, uh, we were looking for actually offices for our, uh, our consulting company. Uh, and sure enough, we were looking at, uh, at the spaces around, around town and good rent and, you know, a good deal. And we are actually real estate agents stumbled upon that little, uh, little local there, on the, right in front of Parc La Fontaine. And then we figured, well, you know what? Maybe we could do the office in the bar as well. And it was, it was something we never thought about before. We're actually looking for just a little space, uh, make our syrups, make our, our prep in there, uh, have our stuff, our shakers, our tools, just for the events, actually, and just live on that for a few years. And then down the road, maybe have our own bar. And so the deal was good. Um, the place was uh, a little tricky. Uh, there was kind of a curse going on with this corner there. It's been bar for 20, 25 years and plus. And the people were saying, dude, you guys are crazy. Like, it's never going to work. This place is cursed. Uh, and we're like, you know what? For the kind of place that we want to have, like a destination place, kind of off the beaten path kind of place, um, we'll try it. And the, the rent was very interesting as well. It's not a very walking street, obviously, not like St. Laurent and St. Denis. But we did it anyway. And um, it worked out well. Uh, so far, it, that's what it did. Same as Nico, um, I was more sweat equity than anything else. Uh, there were actually three partners. It was Fabien Maillard, myself, and Fab had a girlfriend as well, uh, who actually put most of the money in the, in the business. So also that got tricky because um, Phil was saying about uh, finding a good partner. Uh, when you also partner up with somebody that was a friend or uh, with a couple, it can also be a little tricky because you try to have 30-30-30, uh, uh, but since they live together, they have most of the, the decisions. So if you add them together, which most of the time they will agree also, they'll have, they will have 60% uh, of the decisions to be made, or 66% decisions to be made. So this should be, in my mind, should be 50%, 50 50% to be equal in, in the partnership there. Well, you could actually structure that so that you're a 33% owner, but that they have a voting right block of 50%. Yeah. So you have ownership and you have voting rights. Absolutely. And it's, it's the kind of things you learn when you live it. It's not something that you can take a course of. Uh, obviously, there are errors we made, uh, things that we... Uh, and you, you, you learn a lot. I mean, there are a lot of things that we're not going to repeat. Uh, if I ever have a bar, would I have another partner? Just like Phil said, I probably would, given the right time, the right circumstances, uh, and, uh, yeah, the right timing, pretty much. What was the biggest mistake you made? That's a good question. Probably the biggest mistake is that we didn't have enough of the, uh, the work-life balance. Uh, we were always there, we're always full-time, always in the face of each other, and kind of stepping in each other's foot. Uh, what happened when we actually got there, we were in business for about six years before that. We were doing a lot of events, a lot of consulting, and I was mostly bringing the flair bartending part back in the day, and Fab was more in the mixology part. So we kind of, we kind of completed each other that way, uh, but we, did have, we didn't work out a schedule that made sense. So both of us were tired at the same time altogether, working full-time. That would be, be the, the biggest one, I guess. What about you, Nico? Yeah, no, for me, obviously, the, 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 Danico is not open yet, and, um, and Mace is only one year old. But uh, I would think, like, the only mistake is maybe to jump too fast on a, on a location. You know, guys, uh, how important is the location for a bar, and especially in a city like New York. And, um, and I jump maybe too fast on uh, that location. I have new seats, a good location, but if I had to make it again, maybe I would think again and maybe being closer to the center. Yeah. I think so, because Avenue C can be, a, can be a bit tricky, especially on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It can be like a bit far. So, um, yeah, it's a, just a location problem for me. And Sam, you said you'd open a bar again, right? What do you think you'd be able to do now that you weren't able to do then? Do you have more money? Do you think that would help or a better view? Uh, better view, definitely. More maturity in the business. Uh, we're talking about eight years experience. So, uh, yeah, there would be... First of all, the scene has changed completely. Uh, it's evolved. It's evolved like uh, light years ago because the lab was one of the first cocktail bars. It was also this three that was open for uh, for a few years. There was Les Samois as well that existed. So we weren't exactly the first one, but the small first one that did craft cocktails, I guess. Um, Right now, I mean, I think it would be easier to open one, not for just experience, but there are so many good bartenders nowadays that actually take it as a craft and not just a student uh, student job like eight to ten years ago. So I would definitely have a maybe a, a smaller place, probably a smaller place with a lower rent, something that's easily manageable as well, um, or maybe something with volume. Who knows? It depends uh, depends on where the, the scene goes. Definitely for cocktails too, but definitely the service is going to be the uh, would be the main the main key. Uh, 
to in this bar there. Solid, and obviously the lab has its own range of products that it's brought out. Um, we see that a lot. Now, Nico, since opening Mace, have you been able to take advantage of any other business opportunities like consulting or, or things like that that step away from the bar a little bit? Yeah, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, I was going to talk about that quickly. It's, it's like you need to, to know what you want to do as well. Like um, I have a good friend of mine that uh, opened Mabel uh, in Paris. And it's a couple, they're, they're together and they took the whole money from the bank. They don't have external investors, but they're at the bar 24 hours a day and they work super hard. And they have no opportunity to do consulting and stuff outside, like doing stuff I'm doing right now with uh, coming here in Montreal and present because they're 100% at the bar. So you need to, you need to figure out that uh, when you open a business. Do you want to go around? Do you want to consult? Do you want to go to tales? And, or do you want to stay at the bar and being behind the bar all the time? And that's very important when you define your share at the beginning. For, for my side, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm very lucky to work with uh, Greg Baum. You know, I, I said he's the owner of Cocktail Kingdom, so I start working on a range of um, tools um, with Cocktail Kingdom. So at the moment, I just did a, a stirrer, but uh, a mixing lack is coming. So a lot of stuff like that. And of course, like consulting, of course, um, doing like seminars, judging competitions, so taking advantage of the reputation of the bar. And that's a good thing. Like if you, what I want, what, for me what's important to do is to build like, um, how you will say in English, a window, a window for the bar. So you, you show what you're able to do, to be able to do like stuff on the side. So that's as much as important as, as the bar. And yeah, you are seeing like, yes, of course, the, the, the bad side of that is not, not behind the bar all the time, not at the bar all the time. And sometimes, you know, people come to see you, uh, oh no, I'm in Paris, I'm in London or here. So you have to play with all that. It's, it's a bit tricky, but you definitely need to know what you really want to do when you open your bar, that balance of being there, uh, investors and all that. If I may, Nico, uh, you're touching a point there that I find very important as well. Um, it's important to find out what you want to do with your bar and what you don't want to do right now. I think you have to make priorities. Uh, do I want to have a bar, uh, serve cocktails, and then do consulting at the same time? Do I want my uh, line of glassware in a year and two years down the road? Or do I want to have everything together at the same time, which is usually a, a, a big mistake. Try to have everything, a bar school, a, a line of syrups or bitters. It's actually hard to do, and uh, it's you just have to clone yourself at one point. It's just, uh, just not possible to do everything at once. So I think there's a lot of things that come down the road. You have to pace yourself. Uh, we all have big dreams, a lot of ambitious people in the room for sure, but you have to, you know, take it easy, see where this is going, and go with the flow maker plan, definitely. But you know, as well, like some people say, but how do you do to open uh, your own bar in, uh, in, uh, in New York and Paris? How are you going to deal, deal with that? And as well, you know, of course, I don't have the majority of share. I'm not, I'm not going to get rich with the money coming from those bars, but even if I'm in New York or Paris, I have my business, business partner taking care of the job, and they have already structures in place for the, the accountant, the lawyers, and all like that that I don't need to put in place. So it's a lot of, it's a gain of money, it's a gain of time, but of course on the other side, you, you lose because you have less share and stuff like that. But it's, uh, you, once again, you need to know what you want. It's, it's an interesting one. Uh, something I've seen a lot, and I know you've seen it, well, bo both of you, is um, I've got two friends in England, Tristan and Tom, and they were, they were bartenders, they were good, um, not amazing, and they were hired by Diageo to become uh, trainers and consultants. And they spent three or four years going around England. And, you know, it's a nice salary and all. And they got to learn how to be amazing. They became absolute masters of molecular mixology. And eventually, they quit their jobs and opened a bar. No, not just with the money they'd saved up, but also with the contacts they'd made. There were people writing about them. And the fact that they uh, knew so much about making these beautiful, elaborate drinks. And when the bar was open, they were able to, you know, teach their own cocktail classes, have events. And now they've got another bar open and they're doing consulting again. So there's a path now that you can open a bar by first building a network as perhaps a brand ambassador or a trainer or something like that. And maybe saving a bit of money as well. And then open the bar and then, if all is well, continue the consulting too. I think it's a, yeah, could be the case. I mean, for myself, I became brand ambassador after opening a bar when you kind of check all the boxes in the business. Okay, so I've started beginning of the ladder. I've been a busboy, I've been a waiter, I've been a bartender. And it's kind of one point, it's just kind of a, a logical step that you want to take in your career and uh, be in a brand. But definitely, Things are different in, in Canada or in Quebec. I mean, the laws, we all know we cannot infuse, we can't age cocktails. It does make things a lot difficult when we want to take the scene to another level. Uh, hopefully, knock on wood, it's going to change soon. We try to make a change. Uh, but you do have to 
take care of all those those problems there and uh, yeah, make yourself a career and make it clear with your partner what you would like to do versus what they mean more you were talking about before, what more means to them as well. That I think that goes into what you're saying before there. Yeah. I think it's crucial. All right, we've probably got a couple of minutes. You can always grab me or Nico when we're looking for the coffee machine outside. But has anybody got a question they'd like to ask? Something brutally honest and... Sweat equity. You want to take this one? No, it's just uh, it's just a negotiation between you know, it's it's about like the time you're gonna spend at the bar. It's about like uh, your value as well. You know how how with the press, um, it's it's just like one to one uh, negotiation. But it, it, there's no rule. There's no rule. Of course, you 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 don't want to um, to steal. You want to, to you want to show. You. It's a balance because you want to. For me, for my case. If I will be at the bar 100% of the time, and will be day and night, then I will ask for more. But at the same time, I'm traveling a lot. But um, that's something you did at the beginning. For example, in Paris at, at, at Danico, uh, they asked me, oh, you want to open a bar? And I said, but you know me, I want to live in New York, and you know that. And I told them at the beginning, I will be in Paris. Maybe it will change, but at the beginning, I told them I will be in Paris maximum 25% of the year. And that was the part of the deal. So of course, when you say that, you can ask too much here. You know, it's, uh, it's a balance. Uh, once again, it's... Uh, according to what you want and what you want to do as well. Yeah, I think, I think Nico's uh, has got a point there. I think it's, uh, it's a matter of what you feel like uh, your, your brand, your person can bring to the, to the table. Are you, uh, have you won bartending competitions? Do you think that the place in your bar is to bring people? Uh, how much is that worth in your, in, in your partnership? Uh, how much is that worth in your business? How many partners do you have? Uh, is there another person that can bring the same, the same thing as you in the bar as well? So put everything in a balance. And I think like Nico said, there's no written rules. It's really like uh, a conversation you got to have and, uh, and write your own, your own law about it in your place, I would say. I'd say one useful metric is look at what it would cost that person to hire you as a consultant. If they wanted to hire you and say, right, we want you to be at the bar, I don't know, three nights a week for a year and come up with it and we want to use your name and your network and we want to have guests and all that. If they wanted to get a really big consulting contract, what would you charge them? And then compare that to the cash. See what I mean? That, that would be my answer. Maybe one more question, sir? One important thing in the bar industry as an owner is finding talent and keeping that talent, as you were saying and all the stuff. Uh, one thing for sure, it's easier for uh, people in the kitchen it's to do stages outside of the country, going in France, going in Macaron, Macaron Michelin, and but in the front of the house, it's something that we don't see as much has been done. And the career as a bartender is something similar to a cook at some point, learning new technique and anything like that. Do you see any solution to help that kind of exchange between establishment and country? But, no, sorry, that's actually a good question, but that's actually the, the, the subject, the topic of the next seminar, like how the bartenders like, are doing more like chefs, not doing pop-ups and stuff like that, and uh, that is changing, because yeah, you, will, you will ask like 10 years ago like, about shares and moving and doing what we do. There was no so many bar shows, there was no so many stuff and consulting and stuff like that, so it's changing right now. And if you stay here and listen to what you, the, the next topic is going to be about that, about like the new modern bartender and going all around the world and being the time passing behind the bar. Like, do you mean like pop-ups and... Not only pop-ups, just going somewhere as a chef, like a lot of cooks will do a few weeks, a month, will go to a Régis Marcon uh, restaurant, they will learn stuff over there and then they will come back. And it will be possible to do stuff in different stages like that. Well, let's, let's take that as Nico says in the next uh, session, because you have to finish anyway. So uh, thanks very much, Nico, Sam. Thank you, Phil. And thank you guys. See you in the next session.